1853. 1850, he finally settles in a home. He moves to 255 Main Street in Concord, Mass. Um, and this is his home for life. Uh, and this home also his father and his mother and his sister Sophia is living in. And, a, uh, and his cousin Edward Hoare, who he shared the burning of Walden with. Okay. Um, this is what he considers his most settled time. And because he's settled, he's able to take on academic pursuits. Um, and he becomes in, uh, increasingly fascinated with natural history, tra travel narratives. He's reading other people's tra travel narratives. Expeditions, expedition narratives. Uh, don't forget people at the time are now traveling to the North and the South Pole. North and South Pole. Um, there's a lot of travel in the Himalayas going on. There's travel throughout countries that have never been seen or heard of. And he's getting his hands on all of it. This is also the same time that he's getting into botany. And this is at the point where he actually writes The Wild Fruit, which again is something that um, Martha read from. Um, and is really interested in a brand new science. Think of this, 1851, a brand new science, biology, a science that did not exist beforehand. Uh, and he's still reading Darwin and Alexander von Humboldt. Um, and he begins to keep detailed observations of everything, the trees in his yard, the, the grass, everything. And so he decides, oh, by the way, this detailed observation that he writes, it's a two million word journal uh, that he kept for 24 years. Uh, and of course, that journal is not published. It's in the hands of Princeton University right now, and I'm sure that it, they're looking towards having that finalized, they say, by 2020. Um, so what, is he, what, he just, what does he decide to do? He decides to apply for the surveyor position in Concord, Mass. And he applies for that, yeah, one, because he needs a little dough in his pocket, but two, because he can do constant observation. So he gets 26 miles, 26 square miles of land to look at. And this is his life. Now remember, he's still writing for the dial. He's still fighting for abolition. He's still uh, caring for his sister. Uh, he's still traveling. He's still writing. So what he decides to do is he decides that he's going to go on his own expeditions. So what does he do? In, in 1851, he goes to Cape Cod. And he proceeds to go to Cape Cod four more times in that year. Um, he goes to Maine. He goes to Quebec. Uh, so in 18, uh, 18, and this is all throughout 1851 and 1852. In 1853, um, while, while he was in Quebec, he journaled everything. And so he writes and publishes the excursion to Canada. And he begins at this time to lecture on the travel circuit. And these lectures were Unitarian church lectures. Uh, the first Unitarian of Providence hosted him for the first time. And then the Beacon Street Church did. And he spoke on nature. He spoke on trees. He spoke on birds. He spoke on wildlife. And this is something that was just absolutely wonderful. And he spoke on transcendentalism, his version of transcendentalism. So in 1854, he writes and publishes Slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, he finally publishes Walden, 
which again is published by uh, by Elizabeth uh, Peabody. Uh, he writes the Maine Wood, and he writes the Highland Night. And in 1854, he travels to Philadelphia, and then travels to New York City. These are metropolises. These are things he doesn't like. Now remember, he'd gone to Staten Island a decade before, and the city had changed. It became bigger. Um, so what he also recognized at the time was the inconsistency in wealth. And New York and Philadelphia were prime examples of that. People lived in filth and squalor, the poor lived in filth and squalor, and the wealth lived in absolute opulence. And so what does he decide to do? He decides to write several hundred essays on the issue of poverty and wealth uh, for the dial. By the way, the dial eventually turns into the Atlantic, just if anybody's interested in the, in the history. Um, so while he's there, all of these, all of these uh, are compiled into uh, a book called Miscellaneous. So in 1855, he writes Cape Cod and letters to various persons. In 1856, he writes a Yankee in Canada with anti-slavery and reform papers. Um, 1857, he spends his time at home on Main Street and uh, basically journals and surveys that whole year. Uh, nothing, is writ nothing, is pu nothing is published and nothing is written. And in 1858, he finally writes Winter, because now he's recognizing how important the seasons are. What do the seasons bear? So in 1859, um, while he's out in the wilds, he, con he contracts uh, bronchitis. Um, and now, during this period of time, now remember, he had tuberculosis. It's catching up with him. He now has bronchitis. Uh, doesn't mean that death is imminent. It's just that it's at, at the door. Um, so he's editing and revising all of his unpublished works. And he writes and publishes a plea for Captain Brown, John Brown. Anybody familiar with who Captain John Brown was of Harper's Ferry? Okay. He was the most radical of radical Republicans who went to the South and said, damn it, I'm going to free the slaves myself. And he, and he did, for a period of time. Um, and this was big news. And uh, I forgot who it was that wrote, uh, that read the, oh, it was um, Peter read, uh, his opinion on politics. Well, this particular piece of politics, this abolition thing, this John Brown thing, irked him. And he found that he was on the side of John Brown, even though all of the somewhat reform-minded liberals of the Northeast really disavowed John Brown. So, he, begin, he writes and publishes the remarks after the hanging of John Brown. He was hung for treason. Um, and this again is another awakening for uh, Henry David Thoreau. And finally, in 1859, his father passes. Um, uh, they say it was a coronary issue, but uh, a lot of different stories about his death. Um, anyhow, well, we're supposed to break for somebody to come up here, but I'm just going to continue on to, uh, on to the fourth segment of the biography. Okay, fourth segment, 1860. 1860, he writes and publishes The Last Days of John Brown. This is where he says, 
all of you, all of you reform-minded liberal leftists. Now remember, those were Republicans at the time. You don't understand what 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 this guy was trying to do. You have no idea the great works. <clears throat> and he is beginning to be hated by his close friends. And he and Ralph Waldo Emerson have this combative relationship because of his support of John Brown. Um, so he writes uh, The Fall of the Leaf. That's never published. It has, hasn't been published. It's held right now by Princeton Press, Princeton University Press. All right, bugs. Um, and in 1861, he writes and publishes Walking. Writes and publishes, I'm sorry, writes Early Spring in Massachusetts. And this is where he begins to travel to the Midwest. And this is 1861. Remember, the Midwest was the far west of the time. That was the new west. It's not California. So he goes to the Great Lakes and he swims in the cold waters of the Great Lakes and he writes all about it. And the dunes. Now his story about Toro in, Cape, in the Cape, a uh, little blurb that he wrote about the dunes of Toro. Well, he writes about the dunes of the, of the Great Lakes. Uh, he goes to St. Paul, Minneapolis. What the hell is there in 1861? Uh, Mackerel Islands, uh, Niagara Falls, Detroit. Now remember, Detroit at this particular point in time only housed some handful of cool French folk who had enough of Quebec and some Native Americans. Uh, went to Chicago and went to Milwaukee. And yes, there was brewing going on in Milwaukee, but he was not interested in that. Um, so in 1862, uh, he writes uh, Autumnal Tints, Wild Apples, and the History of the Apple Tree. Um, believe it or not, the Americas are the only places, the only place in the world at the time that had the plenty of apples, all of the variations. Um, and he tells the story of the Granny Smith, which is actually a native of the state of Rhode Island. Um, and he writes Autumn. Not, none of these were published. Uh, and they're still in. They're still being held by uh, Princeton. In 1863, he's frantically writing, um, and uh, he's beginning to fall ill. And he writes and publishes the excursions, uh, left without principle, night and moonlight, and I was made erect and lone. Um, and May 1st, his Aunt Louisa comes by and asks him if he had made peace with God. And this is his reply. I did not know we had had a quarrel. <laughs> so May 6th, at the age of 44, aware that he was dying, uh, he says, and these are his last words, and remember, we always think last words are really cool last words, right? Because, I mean, he was a writer, he, he was a great lecturer, and he would come out with some real good doozies, right? This is what he says in, in three separate, at three separate times. Now comes good sailing. Pause. Moose. Pause. Indian and dies. Complications of TB and bronchitis and lung disease. So he's buried 
first at the Dunbar Cemetery and then is removed to uh, Sleepy Hollow. Dunbar Cemetery uh, is now under pavement where Walmart is today. But he's in the historic Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Mass, where most of, of uh, the great Concord uh, writers are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens post-death. And his best friend Harrison Gray Otis Blake uh, he decides I'm going to edit and pub I'm going to try to edit and publish all of what he has left that has been unpublished. And so in the 1890s uh, some of his poems, essays, and journal entries are published. Um, and those are miscellaneous, uh, familiar letters of Henry David Thoreau, po excuse me, poems of nature, and some unpublished letters of Henry David and his sister Sophia. Now, in 1873, Ellery Channing publishes the first biography of Henry David Thoreau called Thoreau and the Poet Naturalist. And this is where, because of Ellery Channing's uh, connection and his height in the intellectual movement, this puts Thoreau on the map for the rest of the world. So, in, 18, in 1906, um, Princeton University Press publishes a handful of things, uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of, a couple of them. Uh, the first and last journeys, the first and last journey of Henry David Thoreau, the journal of Henry David Thoreau, and, um, and the great poets of the English language, America. That was also published later on uh, by Viking Press. Why did everything go to Princeton? Why did everything go to Princeton? Everything went to Princeton because all, all he, now remember, he died penniless. Okay? Uh, but every single piece of work that he ever wrote, he bequeaths to Princeton University. And why does he do that? Because of his hatred of Harvard. <laughs> um, so, in 19 um, and in 1998, um, Thoreau Thoreau's legacy is put together under the Thoreau Society in Concord. Uh, and that's, that honors his legacy, and every little stick, his clothing, his bed, his house, everything uh, is still intact, and you can go into the museum and see it. Uh, just to let you know, uh, his mother dies shortly after that, and his sister dies shortly after the mother passing. Um, and there are no direct Thoreau descendants of, that, of those four children. Um, and so, uh, last but not least, Washington Square, or New York University Press, in 1958, um, releases The Correspondence of Henry David Thoreau. And these are all, if you want to read that, it's, it's really interesting if you're interested in who the people were at the time. These are his conversations with dignitaries and writers and thinkers and leaders of the world. Uh, and so anyways, that's Henry David Thoreau. I guess I'm going to close up where Peter should be, uh, thanking everybody who showed up today, um, thanking Martha for the great food and her wonderful uh, readings, thanking Carol, Peter, and uh, Dan Stevens. And, uh, and we're going to, of course, thank the Blueberry Patch.
and Dallas for what he's left us.